me think. All right. Well, let's start with the easy questions. Could you tell us your name? My full name is Martha Eichenlau Padgett. I was born in Yugoslavia that used to belong to Hungary before World War II. I learned my art from my great-grandmother because she was Hungarian. And I was about 10 years old. We were getting ready for Easter. And I asked her, how did they do their eggs when she was a little girl? And she told me, well, they used to take natural dyes like onion skins, paprika, um, anything that would dye an egg. And then they'd scratch it off, scratch a design in it. And I couldn't fathom it, so she actually did one for me, so I could see how it's done. And I was hooked. From that day on, I did eggs, which was a couple of years ago. That's wonderful. I think that's such a great thing that you get to carry with you. Well, what I like about it now is I'm also continuing her existence in my mind by teaching others. And every time somebody picks up an egg and does that, my great-grandmother is still alive in my mind. So that's her legacy to me. That's wonderful. And um, for the benefit of, I, get, I know exactly what you talk, are talking about and I've seen your work, but we'll be able to, when we finish the video, um, put pictures of some of the ones that you've done so the people viewing will be able sure. to see it. But if you really want to see some of them, they're over at the art gallery. Well, that's true. I got a whole bunch of them there. That's great. Now, um, now you mentioned you were born in Yugoslavia. Would you like to tell us a little bit about growing up there? Well, it was kind of interesting growing up then because, uh, well, <clears throat> how would I describe my hometown? Zrenjanin was at first, when my great-grandfather was born, my grandfather was born, not great-grandfather, it was under the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Well, then, it was taken over by Serbia. It was under the Serbian king. Then World War II came around and we became part of Germany. Then the Russians came to, quote, liberate us. Now we were part Russians. When I was born, I was still in Germany. Then the Russians came in. When my brother was born, he was born in Yugoslavia. And we all lived in the same house, never moved. So you got up in the morning, you went downtown, looked at the flag, and that's the country you were in that year. So it was kind of interesting. And uh, after the liberation, my father was taken and put in a concentration camp because he had a German last name. Now, my father was born there. He was never a German sympathizer. And uh, he helped a lot of people escape Yugoslavia because he was German. He used his German background to help other people. and. Uh, Anyways, there was this one lady, her name was Latinka, and she was like a, they called her match lady or, or bag lady or whatever you want to call her. She was always on the street selling whatever odds and ends because there was nothing during World War II. There was, you couldn't get anything. And my father, at that time, he was quite rich. He was a multimillionaire. What he would do is give stuff to her just to sell, 
You know, he felt sorry for the lady. Well, when he got taken into the, the concentration camp, my mom was selling some of our stuff, trying to make up, you know, get some money to survive on because they confiscated everything. All the stores, everything that dad had. So she sells a Latinka on the street and she got, Latinka asked my mom, where is your father, where is Joseph? And she says, while he's in concentration camp. And she says, don't worry about it. At that time, Zlatinka was all dressed up nice and everything. My mother couldn't figure out what to place. How one minute she was a street lady, the next minute she's dressed real nice. She says, well, I was a spy for Tito. She says, Joseph will be out in three days. And sure enough, in three days they let my father go. But not my grandmother. My mother had to buy her out as a babysitter helper. But then, as a child, I grew up. I was, I'm Catholic, so I went to ch church all the time. But we had to sneak in there because if they found out that we went to church, we'd be in trouble in school because you weren't allowed to go to, you were supposed to become a communist. Uh, but uh, since my father knew a lot of people, I took ballet lessons. And uh, when I was 10, I was offered to go to Russia to study at the Bolshoi Ballet. But my parents said no, because I, I would have had to prove that I am communist. And no, no. But besides that, it was an exciting life. Uh, it was kind of, you always had to look behind your shoulder to make sure you were doing exactly what they expected you to do. Because you didn't know who you could trust, who you could not. And uh, when my father came out of, I call it jail, out of the concentration camp, they put him back in as a, how would you call it, like a manager of different stores, including all of ours that they took away from us, right? Anyways, he was arrested three times, quote, for embezzling, because he just would not become a member of the Communist Party. So the third time around, he was in there, and this one man whose father he saved, my father saved, saw him. He says, what are you doing in here again? He says, well, I just, <laughs> I'm on my summer vacation. So he says, I want to write a letter to the German Red Cross. And he gave my father a brown paper bag, and my father wrote a letter to the German Red Cross, folded it up, and the guy bought the stamp, took it out of the concentration camp, and sent it to Germany. Then we got a letter from Germany, come to Germany immediately. So when my father got out of jail the third time around, he started packing up, you know, what we could take with us, and his friends took him out for a last hurrah. Anyways, they were sitting around the table, and my father was really hot. I mean, he was mad, because he loved where we lived, you know. And uh, he was telling his friend, these damn communists, this is all the stuff I did for this country and everything, this is, and they still won't leave me alone, this is, I am me, I am Joseph, I do not intend to become a communist. I love Yugoslavia, I love my home. And all the time, a friend of his is kicking him under the table because there was this one stranger that my father didn't know. And the guy across, sitting from my father, he says, well, 
Mr. Kramer, I have news for you. He says, I am the head of the secret police. Well, my father thought that was it. He says, but since I know Stavel, who is also good for, you know, he's the one that was kicking my father under the table. He says, and I've heard about you. He says, I have arrest papers for you. I just received them. He says, I'll hold them up for three days. But in three days, you better get the hell out of here. So he came home that night. The next morning, he packed up our clothes and took off. Got on a train, started towards uh, Ljubljana, well, started towards Germany. And uh, I was on the Orient Express, believe it or not. That's the train that went from Yugoslavia to Germany. And just before we got to the Austrian border, my grandparents got off, and uh, my father kissed us all and went into another car. And I couldn't figure out why. And Mom says, be quiet. Daddy is not with us. I said, well, he was just here. What happened? He says, she says, just, just be quiet, and if anybody comes and asks, Daddy's not with us. You don't know where he is. Nobody came. We got across the border, because Mom and Dad didn't trust the guy. She figured they would still come and nab us right at the border. No, they didn't. We ended up in Germany, and uh, we were in Pitting, which is uh, all, all the refugees. It was a refugee camp. And then from there we went to Bremerhaven. And I studied, I went to school there for three years. And I studied to become a dental technician. Then we got the papers to go to Australia, because my parents applied to two places, America and Australia. And I said, oh God, no, I don't want to go to Australia. I was, when I was a little girl, we went to the movies and I'd go all to the American movies, and I would close my eyes and just listen. I loved the American language, not the English, that, that boot stuff, and they, they kind of talk funny, but the American language, I loved it. And, oh God, Cary Grant was my dream man. I always thought all Americans going to look just like him. Anyways. We got here, and the German uprising was at that, uh, the Hungarian uprising was at the same time. It was in 1956. So we got asked by the Australian government if it's okay if we waited, because they have to ship all those Hungarians over there. So thank God we missed the boat. Two weeks later, we get a letter from the American embassy. We went to Hamburg, they checked us all out, all the paperwork and all that. I mean, they got, we got shots and x-rays and I don't know what everything. And we got on Bremen, which was a ship that came to America. And I tell you, when I saw that lady, I still have to cry when I see her. I mean, to me, she was the most beautiful sight I ever saw. And my father made me step off the boat first. He said, you're the luckiest of us all. And I tell you, I, I couldn't speak English, but I was so excited. I was in America. And uh, when we got to Rochester, New York, my father had a job at Strong Memorial Hospital. Now he went from a multimillionaire to cleaning dog pants. But he didn't care. He gave us a home that he figured we were not going to be prosecuted, persecuted all the time, you know. And mom worked for Hickey Freeman, and I went to Strong Memorial as a candy striper. <laughs> and then I went to school for one year here in America. They put me in the ninth grade. Now in Germany, I was working as a dental technician already. 
And I was 16 year old, and they put me in the ninth grade. You know, like I said, what am I doing here? So I uh, finished that one year, and uh, they put me in English 102 at Ben Franklin High. I had social studies, which I had a Polish teacher, and I understood what he was saying, so I, I passed it with a C plus. I was good. German, I passed, German one, uh, three and four I had, I passed that with A. I mean, I knew better German than my teacher did. But the rest of it, forget it. Algebra, I failed. I still say pi are round, not square. I don't care what they say. But uh, then I got married to a German guy, and it didn't work out. But I was blessed by two kids, daughter and a son. So I will always be thankful for that. I got my divorce, went down to New Orleans. I became a Playboy bunny. I was a bunny for about a year. But I didn't like that because they demanded too much. Are you telling me the truth? Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's fascinating. It was in 1969. I was a Playboy bunny in New Orleans. But uh, then I went up to Chicago and I lived there with my parents. I was a job counselor. And then I said, nah, I don't like Chicago, not for my kids. They had the uprising then and all that, too much trouble. Besides, my mother was uh, taking care of an apartment building for uh, Mr. Flanty, and uh, my son and my, my uh, brother, who are about three days apart in birth, okay, they both come in and say, look, mommy, we found this. This guy was putting it inside the brick in the house. He took the brick out, and it was a great big bag. He said, it's tea, mommy. It was marijuana. And I said, I'm out of here. Went back to Rochester. I got married to a guy that was vice president of Rochester Savings Bank. But she was a very nice guy. I really liked him, but he had a very bad problem. He was an awful alcoholic. And uh, then I moved to Columbus, Ohio, as a barmaid there at the Desert Inn for about three years. And then I met my hillbilly, James Arthur Eichenlaub, and fell madly in love with him. I was running down, I was working at the Badlands, and he was coming up from there. He was retired from the Air Force. He was a sergeant in, in the Air Force. And he was working as a sort of superintendent for the Badlands. Anything that went wrong, he fixed it. And he took care of the apartments, Broadland Apartments on Broad Street. And uh, I was running down to the Badlands. Op I was trying to open up because it was only open in the afternoon and evenings. And uh, I was running down the stairs, and he was coming up, and we bumped into each other, literally. And I stood there, and I had butterflies all over. I looked in his eyes, and it was it. And I opened up Badlands, went back upstairs, and I asked one of the waitresses, because they were talking to him. And I said, who is that guy? And she says, oh, that's Ike. He's a very nice guy, but he's retired from the Air Force, and he just does odd jobs around here to keep himself busy. I says, guess what? She said, what? I says, he's going to be my husband. She looked at me, she says, what? I said, uh-huh. I said, that guy is going to be my husband. Eight months later, we were married. Because he kept coming in at night, and... Uh, through the Badlands, and uh, we got to know each other, and the first thing he did was give me a massage on my back, because that's why I, you stand all night long, you know. And I was really tired. We had a bad snowstorm that day, 
I said, oh, God, I'm so tired. He says, well, come here, and I'll give you a massage on your back. So he gave me a massage, and I says, oh, I'll follow you like a puppy dog if you do keep doing that. As I said, eight months later, we were married, and we were married for 21 blissful years. He brought me down here to meet his family, and I fell in love with this area. I said, I was in Europe. I was all over the United States by then. I said, I've never seen anything so beautiful in my life. I said, the rolling hills, the little creeks, the people, the, it just, I don't know, it just stole my heart, just like he did. And I said, what are we living up in Columbus for? So we came down and bought five acres, because when I was married to him, believe it or not, I was, we were into home repairs. I was a roofer, a carpenter, I did ceilings, I name it, I done it with him. So I said, we can do that down there too. So we moved down here, we bought a place that used to belong to his grandmother and grandfather. But his brother sold it before we got it, he sold it to his cousin. And he divided it into three different places. So we bought the first five acres, and then we bought the other 18 acres, and then we went and bought the other 13 acres. So we ended up with 32 acres. We just about got the whole property back. So unfortunately, 21 years after we got married, he died. And I was single, but before he died, I promised him I was going to remarry because he was 15 years older than I was. In the meantime, while he was alive, he bought me some geese, and I really started getting into my egg business. People just, I just went to, you know, different, oh, what do they call them, uh, fairs and things like that. And uh, my girlfriend, she stole one of, two of my, three of my eggs, actually, and she took them over to the Scioto County Fair. And I won first and third prize, unbeknownst to me. Then she says to me, why don't we go to the fair? And I hate going to the fair because it's just too much noise, dirt, hot, you know, it's, it just, I, I, I don't want to go. But she, come on, she said, just the two of us, let's get away from everything and just, just for a little while. I said, okay. So we went. Her name is Betty, Betty Davis. I said, Betty, I'm going to kill you one day for doing this to me. She said, oh, come on now, shut up and let's go. So we did. Then we went on the upper side. Just as you go in a fair, turn to the left, and there's this art building. She says, oh, come on. She says, you're an artist. Let's go look. I said, that sounds interesting. Okay, let's go look. I go in here. There's three, three of my eggs are sitting there. First prize, third prize. I said, I can't believe this. And she was laughing her head off. She says, well, I just had to do this. She said, you constantly give the stuff away, teach everybody, but you never make anything on it. She said, it's time you do something with it. So I started selling some of them. I gave the one to uh, the Make and Wish Foundation. There was a golden egg. And the other one, the first prize I kept, it was a uh, uh, coyote, the trickster from the American Indian blower. I said, well, she tricked me into this, so I kept the trickster. And uh, anyways, uh, then I got, my brother started going to school here. And uh, to Shawnee. And I got to meet a couple of the teachers and stuff. And uh, I started bugging everybody. I said, why is it that we have a fine arts university here and yet no place to display the art? So 
So I said, well, there is one. I said, well, where is it? Well, they said, bring your art, and they put it, on, put it into the uh, gallery in, uh, oh, what is it, the Appleton Gallery. I said, well, people don't even know this stuff exists. Nobody knows about it. And uh, anyways, it was, they were in there for a while, and I got to meet uh, the Portsmouth Arts Council. I forget her name now. She was awful nice. She was the wife of one of the teachers, art teachers. Anyways, uh, I got to talk with her, and she finally got together all the artists around here. And uh, we started our own group. Then we decided, well, we got to have some place to display the art. And we started the art center. At first, it was rough going. It still is. But uh, we had to divide ourselves. And part of us became the uh, Bonny Fiddle Arts Group, Artist Group which we sell our art, and the other is the Bony Fiddle Art Center, which, again, it's the same people. We teach other people how to do art. We take art from the schools and anybody, you know, and display their art. And finally, we got our art center. And I'm very, very tickled that finally we can all get together, and I love going in there. I volunteer two afternoons every week, and that's my home away from home. But before that even started, I also got invited. I, be, I joined, um, what's it called, uh, Ohio Designer Crafters on Fifth Avenue in, in Portsmouth, in Columbus. And uh, they asked us to make Christmas tree decorations for the governor's mansion. I said, oh, well, why not? I made one. The first year it was home. That was a thing. So I put the governor's mansion on one of my eggs, and I put uh, on, all around it white pearls so it looked like it was snowing, and on the back I put the gray seal on Ohio, of Ohio on there, and I won first prize. And I got invited, I got to meet the governor, I took my mother with me, and uh, she couldn't believe that I was going to go see a governor. You know, that was... So anyways, we went, and it was on her birthday, December 13th. So I couldn't... I, that was the most memorable day of my life, because <coughs> she got to talking to the governor, and he fell in love with her, because she was short. She was 80-some years old, and uh, the governor... Just and also Hope, his wife, they were just the sweetest people you ever want to meet. And I told him, I said, well, it's a special day. I said, number one, we got to meet you. Number two, it's my mother's birthday. And I said, I couldn't think of a better thing to give her than to bring her with me. He picked her up, gave her a big kiss, twirled her around, and she looked at me, and she, after he put her down, he goes, in Hungarian, she says, I never wash this cheek again. She says, what a nice boy. Now here she is about five foot, and he's about six foot four or whatever. I mean, he's tall. And she goes, what a nice boy. I tell you, that just made my heart, it, it made everything worth everything, to see her so happy. And then I made another egg two years later and that was for, I put John Glenn floating in space, and on the bottom of the egg you could see the Cape, well, not the Cape Canaveral, but the rocket, you know. And I made the whole outline look like the state of Ohio. 
And on the back, again, I put the seal of Great Seal of Ohio on it. And I won first prize again. So then I took my second husband, the one I'm married to now, who is a retired Marine. He was a top sergeant in the Marines. And I took him with me. And that was another very proud day of mine. So I had a very exciting life. It started very simple, but here I am, and I've been asked if I would, why don't I move to New York or a place like that where I could really sell my eggs at a good price and all that. And I said, look, I found a place that in my heart called to me all my life. I found it. I was lucky there. I own it. I was even luckier. I said, I live in a country that I absolutely adore. I said, why would I want to move? I said, my egg I do because I love doing them. Now, if I sell one, okay, great. I'll give even now a lot of them away because I love to see the faces of the people when they get one. And every time I do that, God, I don't know, God gave me this gift through my great-grandmother. I cannot make this into a, a, a business business. It's not a business. It's, it's a gift. And I want to make it a gift to other people. So. I will never become rich, I know that. But I'm having a heck of a good time doing it. And to me, that's the important thing. You know, if I'm happy, I can keep other people happy. What else can I ask for? So, you got any questions? You, you are an excellent speaker. I didn't even have to help you. <laughs> keep on going, I love it. Um, <coughs> yeah. You got them all. You're My amazing. are driving me crazy. Oh, yeah. They're awful. My whole face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I keep taking stuff in, but... Mm -hmm. So you've lived here, you've lived here in Scioto County for a while. Um, what well, have I've you lived seen here change? since 1979. That, that's, that's a pretty good long time. Did, um, have you seen things change here? I have noticed Second Street. I've noticed some changes there. I've noticed that it's starting to pick up. It could be part of my bitching. I mean, excuse me, but I have been at everybody and anybody that I could talk to that had any influence at all in Portsmouth government, telling him to turn the city into a beautiful, beautiful tourist place which it could be. And we could make a lot of money here on tourism alone. If they would have horse and buggy rides that would start on Front Street, they could see all of those beautiful murals. Then they could take them down on, on Second Street if we would have tiny little shops, not junk, you know, pretty little things to sell. We would have nice little restaurants. People would flock to this place. They can't help it. I mean, they got Shawnee Forest over there, 68,000 acres of wilderness. My God. You know, people from Europe come over here to see that. But they come to see Second Street and they go, oh my God, that's it, they leave. But if they would fix that up, oh, we would have so much money, we wouldn't know what to do with it, really. We could have the artists sitting outside, and I'm sure most of them would be delighted to do so. And they could be working on their art, people could see that. It would become a, a, a artsy, touristy, wonderful place for all the people around here. We wouldn't have to ship our children out somewhere 
so they can get a living. I mean, I have two kids. One of, both of them are now up in Columbus because they couldn't make a living here. Working for McDonald's, you know, that's not exactly what they went to school for. And there is just nothing here to keep them here. If all the people that we shipped out of here would come back here, do you realize we would be bigger than Cincinnati? I mean, really, we would. Because you go to Columbus, you go to Cincinnati, you pe find so many people, you go down the street or you go into a store and you hear, get out of my road. Uh-oh, you from Portsmouth? Yes. <coughs> that is one thing I, that's my husband always used to say, get out of my road. I said, this is not a road, this is the living room. So that's how I know they're from Portsmouth. You know, they get out of my road. And there's an awful lot of people that are from Portsmouth, educated, that are in other cities instead of right here where they should be. So if you could do something about that, that would absolutely, that would be the crowning glory of my life. As I said, as exciting as I, as I said, my life, I can never say I was bored. We are always something going on. But the biggest dream that I've left is for Portsmouth. Because it is a beautiful little city. It's got wonderful history. Keep it alive. Don't bury it. I told my husband after we were here for a couple of years, I told him, you know, there's only one thing wrong with Portsmouth. He says, what? I said, they forgot to bury it. And then I decided, I'm not going to stop that. I'm going to moan and groan and, as I said, bitch, yes, at anybody I could to get this town back on its feet again. It's a beautiful city, for God's sake. All the German people, you look at the telephone book. Half of them are German. What happened to the German pride? I mean, Germans have backbones like you wouldn't believe it. What happened? We're living on welfare? Come on. No German would ever be proud of that. So why? My question is, why, why, why? There's no reason for it. So, that's all I know. That's all I can tell you. So, I don't know if you have any questions, but... No, you're, you did a fabulous job, and I didn't have to help you at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be because I was in a couple of magazines already, so... Well, ta-da! You are. You're getting, getting used to... You've had, a, had to do to, it before. Yeah, because I was in a... a blah, 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 blah. Over the back fence, mm -hmm. and I was also in the, uh, country living from uh, the electric company. No kidding. I was on the front page. Well. <laughs> Not the Rolling Stones, but yeah, <laughs> I was on the front page. Oh, you make me so happy. <laughs>